I'm Deacon Mark Sandersfeld. I'm at St. Ludamella's Parish here in Cedar Rapids. I've been married for 40 years. Uh, the itinerary or the little write-up they had on me was a little bit dated. And uh, we have six grandchildren. What do you think of Father Scott? Oh, no. <laughs> Where are the Ten Commandments? We can rattle them off. <laughs> I'm not that quick anymore. I've proven that to myself over and over again. You guys are going to stand? That's a five minute warning. Hello, if everyone would please try to make your way to your breakout sessions. They'll be starting at 10 30. Again, if everybody could please make your way to the breakout sessions, they start at 10 30. Thank you. I'll leave it open for now. I won't talk that loud to the father of the class across. So, how's your Lent going? I think uh, Father Scott will shape us up before we leave to make sure we're on the right path for Lent. And it's good that we have reconciliation here today because that's a, well, it's kind of a requirement for Lent, isn't it? But it's a, it's a requirement for us. I've got another handout I'm going to give you, and on that handout it says monthly. Um, that may seem excessive to some of you, but I've been going monthly for about seven years now, and it's, it's good. It's good because we need a clean heart. I can tell I can try to stall for time. <laughs> but no, I, this handout sheet, I'll go over real quick. Um, preparation for this talk, I was asked to do this last fall, and, and um, I could share stories about me being a spiritual man, but that's not what you want to hear. I think what you want to hear is something that's going to challenge you to think about who you are as a spiritual man. Robert, you have several copies up there? But there's more back there. Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, and I've got another handout that's from a, a website that you'll have. As, in fact, it's on this sheet. But anyway, the, the, one of the books that I read that was just really very compelling to me and just kind of like hit me right between the eyes, made me think about who I am as a spiritual man. And that was this book by uh, Deacon Harold Brooks Silvers, or Servers, or Sievers, I mean, um, I forgot to put the word deacon there. This book was so challenging, even his bishop said it challenged him about his lukewarm faith. I mean, a bishop saying that is pretty, pretty humbling, but um, it just talks about what's God called us to do. So that's one book, and I've got, I've got books up here for sale. They're all $13. I just kind of averaged the price. Uh, but who was here for the men's conference when Father Larry Richards was here? You know, he, Scott, Father Scott mentioned Father Larry. If you haven't read his book, Be a Man, I've got 25 copies here. Uh, again, they're $13. But his book, our men's group did uh, shortly before Larry came. And uh, his book is actually available on his website. Um, oh, I didn't put that, uh, his website on here. But you can Google it and find it. Um, but to hear him read that book is what our men's group did. At first we were reading it, and then I had gotten a copy of, uh, of it on tape. And, you know, just listening to Father Larry is, is something else. But it really drives home the point of what we are made for. So that point is I'll get to in a little bit. But... Um, just kind of going down the list of resources. Um, Behold the Man was very challenging to read because it really is calling things black and white. And one thing that's kind of happened to our church is we've gotten very gray with our responsibility of our faith, especially us men. 
How many of you see more men in church than women? And you know, we need to call our brothers that aren't coming to church, to church. And after you hear this talk, I hope that's something that you're compelled to do because it's that important, not just for them, but for their families and especially for their children. So, um, another book I read that was, it's very good on parenting, and that's Man to Man, Dad to Dad. And uh, it's a short book, but uh, Brian uh, Caulfield uh, wrote that book. And then there's a book that is on uh, orderable from, actually I got this from Amazon, but it's from the U.S. Catholic Conference of Bishops from their marriage uh, website. And it's from uh, Mark and Melanie Hart. And it's about what do the scriptures say about your marriage? It's a very powerful book. In fact, my wife and I wrote a presentation on this uh, that we're giving tomorrow up in uh, Rhinebeck. But, you know, who do we go to when we're in trouble? You know, who do we get help from? The best book is, you know, I'll, I'll just reiterate what Father Scott said. This is the only book you need to read. This book has everything in it, from marriage to parenting. Everything's in there, and yet do we read it? So before we begin, I want to start with a prayer. So we'll keep this goldenrod sheet out for you because I'm going to be talking through it a little bit. But let's gather ourselves in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you know this, go ahead and I'm going to say the Holy Spirit prayer. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and we shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of your Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in your consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of this day. Thank you for sending your message through men like Father Scott, who challenge us to become more faithful to your word. Bless all these men, bless their families, and help us to listen and ponder your words. Amen. Amen. So how many of you are married? That's great. How many of you have never been married? Do we have any singles in here? All of us men are called by these very scriptures to be the head of our family. We are supposed to be the spiritual leaders of our family. It's right in the Bible. But like I said earlier, how many men do we see in church? You know, it, it, is, it is the cause of the shift that we see, not only in our church, but in our society. Because as faith goes, so goes the world. So if we have a strong faith community, and I would love to experience his faith community. I mean, wow, a Bible-reading faith community. That's got to have some strength. We are more than called to be the head of our household. We're made to be the head of our household. Have you ever thought of that? When you took your vows, what did you say? I will love you and honor you all the rest of your life, right? But there were some other things in there, and I'll get to that. But what does it mean to be a spiritual leader of your family? To be the spiritual leader of your family. Let's break that down for a bit. What does it mean to be a man? You know, I just talked a little bit about Father Larry's book, Be a Man. It's all in there. But if you can repeat all the Ten Commandments, it's all right there. You know, I just loved it when he could say that so fast. I wish I could rip that off. But what's the first commandment? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. Do not use his name in vain and keep the Sabbath holy. All three of those, us men, are in charge of. We are in charge of keeping those commandments in our homes. 
Never thought of that. What's a Catholic man? Any different than a Christian man? Well, there's a few differences. We believe our marriage is a sacrament. Puts it on a higher level than just a covenant. Because of what? Because we are witnessing Jesus' love to our family and to the world. That's different than just a covenant. Do you guys see yourselves as sacraments with your wife? Do you pray with your wife? These are, I know, don't feel bad if you don't, but that's what we're called to do. Now think for a moment some of the best examples of Christian men. Can anybody name off a few? St. Joseph. Joseph. How about John Paul? John Paul II. You know, I, was, I was like, wow, did he read my talk or what, what was he talking about? But John Paul II was an amazing man. One of my favorite saints is Padre Pio. You know, this guy was just tormented in his life. And he had the stigmatis, right? And he yet, and, and, and he didn't seem like a happy person. I don't know. Well, I'll bring up another topic real quick. How many of you have watched a Christian movie about a saint in the last year? Do you know where a great resource to get those are at? Netflix. I'm not pushing Netflix. But most of the old saint movies Netflix has on DVDs. And instead of watching something that's going to challenge your faith from the networks or HBO or whatever else, have your, sit down, have your family sit down and watch one of these. You can get Netflix for like eight bucks a month. But I'll tell you, I've, I've watched probably at least a hundred of them and I've shared it with our men's group when there's an interesting one. And there's so much richness there that's not being tapped. So what are the qualities of spiritual men? Any suggestions? What's the first one that comes to mind? Faithful. Love. That's a good one. How about obedient to our Father in heaven? Humble. You know, Father Scott's mentioned a few of these. The Beatitudes. Kindness, gentleness, love-filled, spiritually driven. How about forgiving? How forgiving are you as a father? I'm going to get a little bit more in depth on that, but it's our responsibility to be the spiritual leaders. So it's our responsibility to make sure forgiveness is happening in our family. You know, when two of the kids are really going at each other, you know, you ask them to stop it. Okay, apologize to each other. No, ask forgiveness to each other and heal your broken relationship. If you look to the Bible, you know, we have some great examples of spiritual leaders. Any suggestions? Who's your favorite? I love the Ten Commandments and Moses. I mean, he was a great spiritual leader. King David. He was the chosen one. He was chosen by God to lead Israel. And then what did he do? He adultered. <laughs> he killed. I mean, he really blew it. But he turned, he turned around. He turned his life around and, and got back right with the Lord. All of these men had one common trait. They strove to have their life as close to God as possible. And that's really what it means to be a spiritual man. To be as close to our Lord as we possibly can. You know, I'm impressed with Father Scott and driving men to read the Bible at work. It's a great place to do that. You're witnessed. I actually would like to point that out. When he said that, um, I have the Bible on my phone, and I think that I'm going to stop reading the Bible on my phone, and I'm actually going to bring this in so you can witness to people. Yep. I think that's a great idea. 
It's a good point because what could you be doing on the phone? Anything. That's what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I do the liturgy of the hours in the phone, and it just doesn't quite feel right. You know, it's not the book. But anyway, to be a spiritual man, we must be close to God. To be a spiritual man, we must be close to God. What do we associate ourselves more about what we do? We're not doings, we're beings. So to be a spiritual man, we've got to be close to God. My wife and I are very much doers, and one time we were preparing a presentation and a couple was helping us, and they said, we have one question for you guys. Are you, spirit, are you doers or are you beings? Because we read your presentation and you sound like a bunch of doers. Well, that struck me just like right in the head. We were so busy with all the things we were doing that we sounded like doers. Were we being holy? Were we being Christian? Were we being faithful? Were we being prayerful? Those qualities that our Bible talks to us and tells us we should be, but we get busy with everything else and we become doers. You know, our schools teach us to be doers. Our jobs teach us to be doers. But God's asking us to be beings with him beings. It takes a different mindset. We were made for one thing. Do you know what that was for? Procreation. Nope. Sorry. Wasn't that. Why did God make Adam? To love and serve him. Adam was made to love and serve God. He gave him the Garden of Eden to take care of. He gave him all the animals to take care of. But not just for himself but for praise and adoration to God. So we were made to love and serve God. In our, that's in our catechism and it's in our Bible. Um, in, the, in John Paul, St. John Paul II's Theology of the Body, he speaks about that very clearly, why the body was made. And... Our men's group, we, uh, I shared with them uh, a number of videos with uh, Christopher West, made by Christopher West, speaking about the theology of the body. If you ever get a chance to read, don't read the big theology of the body works. Get like the beginning, the, the theology of the body for beginners from Christopher West. It puts it all into more of a, what I would call, readable subject because Pope John Paul's encyclicals on this are very deep. But Christopher West goes, you know, he would, he, Christopher West, if you don't know who he was, he, he's, uh, he used to be a drummer in a band, and then he got called to becoming a voice box for the theology of the body. I'll just put it that way. He had a long passage there, but he goes, you know, I love music, and Mick Jagger, of all people, had it right. I can't get no satisfaction. He goes, I can't get no satisfaction because what was, what's put into our hearts, what's impressed by God on our hearts is to love him. And where do we look for love? You just look at the secular world, we look for love in all the wrong places. I mean, it, this, this Christopher West just loved music, so he would, just, he would actually sing this. I'm not going to sing to you today. <laughs> but anyway, he goes, you know... Mick had it right, we can't get no satisfaction because we're not seeking him. We can only get satisfaction when we love the Lord with all our heart. And Father Scott mentioned that today too. But God is calling us back to be strong men, not weak men. Strong spiritual leaders. It puts us kind of like a you know, if you think about the secular world and all the things that it's done over the years of making men and women equal and actually us men have been kind of pushed down, that's not what the Bible's asking us to be. We're supposed to be strong for our families, strong for our wives. And we can speak out, just like Father Scott mentioned in this prior talk, when people are either using the name of the Lord in vain or... They're talking about some things that aren't really 
subjects that would make God happy. And we can speak out and say, you know, I'm sorry, but you know, I'm a Christian. I don't like that. Um, how many of you have done that? I mean, it's, it's hard. And, and you'll be persecuted for it. But what does it do? It builds your heart. It makes you a stronger man. When we are seeking God's love, we first need to seek Jesus' love in our hearts. You know, the, when we look for love in all the wrong places, our hearts get sensitized to the world's lures. But when we sensitize our hearts through the Gospels and the Word of God, it makes us, what's the word? Directed to Him. You know, it's like a compass that's always stuck facing Jesus. It's a sign that the Knights Columbus use. But how do we, how do, we do that? How do we get our life turned around where we can always have Jesus on our mind? Rather than the pleasures of the world... Do the pleasures of this world give us lasting joy? You know, us men go out and we try to get, 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 get. And in the end, are we satisfied? That's why Mick got it right. I can't get no satisfaction because it's not lasting. It comes and goes. Um, on this light yellow handout. I, I titled this The Seven Habits of a Catholic Man, but there's actually eight, because I forgot one. If you turn the page, what you should do weekly is take your wife out on a date and make it a date. Don't talk about the kids. That's a staff meeting. <laughs> I like that line. I, I plagiarized that one. <laughs> But what was it like to date when you dated? What did you talk about? Your dreams, your aspirations, your love for each other. We talked all the time, now we don't talk at all. Right. So a weekly date will make a marriage last forever, believe me. But what's on here, real quick? Daily prayer. Um, I'm just going to leave that alone for a bit because I'm going to share with you why prayer is so important. You know, Father Larry had probably really influenced my life because he was calling me to my Christian responsibilities. But think for a moment. Where would you be without your faith? I wouldn't be here. I was born and raised a Lutheran, and here I am, a Catholic deacon. How'd that happen? Yeah. Not my will, but your will be done. So, I got here because I married a Catholic. Was it my plan to marry a Catholic? I know it wasn't my parents' plan. <laughs> <laughs> but she's the one that God put in front of me. I even prayed for that before I met my wife. I was in my first homily on prayer. Prayer is powerful. We should begin our day and end our day with prayer. I do jail and prison ministry. I go into Lynn County uh, once a month to do a prayer service. But I also mentor down there. And, and one gentleman shared with me, I don't know, it was, it was about the reading that I think was on, on prayer. And, and he goes, well, this is how important prayer is to me. Before I open my eyes in the morning, I thank God for giving me another day. And I went, Holy crap, I don't do that. I mean, he hit me like right between the eyes. But shouldn't we thank God? In fact, we should, at the beginning of every prayer, thank God for you name it. And when I say a prayer at church in a group, uh, we're getting ready to do Mass, I always begin, thank you, Lord, for this day. A beautiful day, you know, maybe it may be snowing outside, but it's still beautiful. You know, do we appreciate what God's given to us? So, 
Be a spiritual man. Lead your family in that spiritual responsibility. I'm going to get more into this a little bit. But think for a moment how you are as a married man. For those of us who are, are part of a family, we have been given by God. I said this before, but I'm going to say it again. We've been given the responsibilities to be the spiritual leaders of our family. We don't delegate it to our spouses. And unfortunately, that's what we're seeing happen. Why? A whole bunch of reasons, I think. So where did this responsibility come from? You know, he gave Adam Eve, made her out of a rib. Have you ever wondered why he used a rib bone instead of a head bone or a foot bone? Well, he didn't give her a head bone, take part of Adam's head, that she would rule over him. And she didn't take, he didn't take a foot in, in case she wanted to kick him. <laughs> you know, Archbishop Jekyll says this much better than I do, but he gave her, he made her out of a rib because we have many ribs. And if you look how ribs are made, they're, they're, they kind of form the equal sign. That equality was there from the very beginning. But that equality meant that they were equal in certain things. But if you go into Ephesians, where St. Paul and actually uh, Scott, Father Scott mentioned the, uh, the gospel reading from Jesus about what man and woman should be, man is still called to be the head. So what do our vows say? I, Mark, take you, Roseanne, to be my wife. I promise to be true to you in good times and in bad. In sickness and in health, I will love you and honor you all the days of my life. Notice some key words. I promise to be true to you. What's the word true mean? Faithful. Faithful? Yeah, I mean, you can just go down a whole bunch of things. One of my worst ones is procrastinating. That's not being true. I said I'd do it, but I don't get around to it. You know, there's, there's so much in that word of true. I'll never leave her side. I'll be faithful to the promise. True is also faithful, chaste, honest, pure. In good times and bad, in sickness and in health, I will love you and honor you all the days of my life. These last few words, I will love you and honor you all the days of my life. What word comes to mind what those are saying? This one I worked on for a while. Service. Isn't honoring someone a service? When's the last time you threw a surprise birthday party for your wife? My wife told me if I ever did, I'd, she'd kill me. And I did. <laughs> I did it on her 60th, but it was to honor her years of t teaching when she retired and also that she turned the magic number of 60. But it was an honor. I made it an honor. But it was a service that I gave her. To love. What do you do when you love somebody? Think about it when you were dating. What did you do to sway your wife to marry you? Let's not say that you had to sway her to marry you. But didn't you buy her flowers? You bought her treats? You took her out? You served her. We were meant first to love and serve the Lord, and then to love and serve our wife. It's a call that's right in our vows. Now we're going to get into the more meaty stuff. During the 60s and 70s, you never heard this at a wedding, but this is from Ephesians 5, 21 to 33. Wives and husbands... Be subordinate to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives should be subordinate to their husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of his wife, just as Christ is the head of the church. He himself, the savior of the body. As the church is subordinate to Christ, so wives should be subordinate to their husbands in everything. I mean, during the 60s. This was not correct. This was politically incorrect to read at a wedding. Why? Because of one word? 
And the word subordinate, if you go back to its Greek translation, translates into something totally different than what our English word of subordinate means. It doesn't mean that either one rules each other. It doesn't mean that one's below or above each other. I'll get into more about the meaning. But then the, the, it goes on. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Yeah. See, now the women think, man, we've got to be subordinate to them. But what's, the, what's Paul say to the husbands? Love your wives as, as Christ loved the church and handed himself over for her to sanctify her, cleanse her by the bath of water with the word that he might present to himself the church in splendor. We have to die for our wives. That's a little bit more difficult than what the wives got led to believe, right? But they didn't hear these words. <clears throat> so also, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves, himself, loves his wife loves himself. And then I'll skip down. For this reason, a man should leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one. The two shall become one. This is a great mystery, but I speak in reference to Christ and the church. Isn't Christ and the church one? How many of you believe that when you're sitting in a church full of people, Christ is present? Amen. Amen. And Christ, the collective body of Christ in those pews, is praying to Christ in heaven. Amen. Now that's a thought about what kind of prayer is that? That came up in our di diaconate formation. <clears throat> and one lady said, I thought all prayer was prayer. Not all prayer is the prayer. Prayer is prayer, but that collective body of, of, of the church in mass praying to Christ in heaven, that's a powerful, unique prayer because it's not just my one-way link or my two-way link. It's all of us collectively praying our own hearts to the love, to the sacred heart of Jesus. <clears throat> Now I'm going to get into the meat of this reading, because this is important, because this really calls us to be the spiritual leaders of our family. You know, like I said, the 60s and 70s, the women's movement just did not like the word subordinate. But if you look at the Greek translation for subordinate from a man's point of view, it means to be the point man, the one out front. In a military term, how many of you guys were in the military? What's the point man? Out front, watching for any trouble to let the people behind him know. He's the protector. Are you the point man of your family? Are you the protector of your family? Do you guard your house from pornography and all the things that can come into your house, be that via mail, email, the internet, TV, or whatever? That's your job. And if you've got a challenge with that, you've got reconciliation, and on the bottom of that resource sheet, I've got some other resources to help with addiction to pornography. And, you know, we can't escape it. It's in front of us all the time. You can't watch a TV show anymore without some sexual innuendo. Is that what God asked sex to be? Heavens no. I'll get to that in a little bit. But as protectors of our family, we have the responsibility to be the spiritual leaders of not only our wife and our kids, but of their souls. What's your second job besides loving and serving the Lord? Is to get yourself and your whole family to heaven. We tell pre canna couples this. Your number one job is to get each other in heaven, and then your kids. And they all kind of look at us like, you guys are looking at me right now. Huh? <laughs> how do you do that? You become a spiritual leader. And how do you become a spiritual leader? You become one with him every moment of your day. It's not, it's not easy, but it's well worth it. <coughs> it will give you so many benefits. 
and the two shall become one flesh. What what did God mean with that? How many of you think you're opposites of your spouse? I'm holding my hand even being higher. Yeah. We are so opposite. We took tests and we were so opposite. <laughs> Thank goodness they didn't do this before we were married. They probably wouldn't have let us get married. (laughs) But opposites attract. Why? We see qualities in them that we don't have ourselves. And it's attractive. And then we get married, and what happens to those opposite qualities? Yeah. Oh, I just can't stand it when she does that. You know? Go figure. What happened? What happened to the love that you had seen in that quality? Sin. Thinking of myself first. Not making her better than me. Not being subordinate in that love responsibility. Well, many years ago we heard a phrase that, I mean, Rose and I are very opposite. And how many of you are competitive? You put opposites and competitive together, what do you got? You got to fight. You got arguing, you got disagreements. And I think that's why Rose and I were asked to be involved in marriage and kind for 20 years because we just couldn't get it right. You know? But yet, God graced us with these little people that helped us along the way, taught us some things, opened our eyes to things. And this one phrase, I'll never forget as long as I live. God didn't put you together to compete. He put you together <coughs> to complete, to become one, to have unity. And the only letter difference between compete and complete is the letter L. And you know why it's the letter L? It stands for love. But it stands for, it takes a decision to love, to change being competing to completing. You have in your head the ability to make decisions. And men are good at this. We can make a decision just like that. Yeah. Well, sometimes. <laughs> sometimes we've got to think about it for about four months. <laughs> but we can make a decision to love our spouse. And in that decision to love, we can change not only our relationship with our spouse, but our family. We can make a decision to be the spiritual leaders of our families. All it takes is, I'm going to do that. What's the benefits? Heaven. Well, what's it say about bringing someone from sin to heaven? You're granted heaven as well. Well, how about peace and joy? I guarantee you, a family that prays together not only stays together, but they stay together in harmony. So pray with your family. Pray with your spouse. It's a powerful gift that the Lord gave us was the ability to pray. And not just alone, but with our spouse. Like I said, I was born and raised Lutheran. Do Lutherans and Catholics have the same prayers? Kind (laughs) of. What do Lutherans pray? The Our Father, the Our Father, and the Our Father. We don't have a lot of prayers, or the Lutheran and the Protestants don't have a lot of the prayers that the Catholics do. Why? I'm totally off my subject now. Mediation. Why did the church split? Because they were selling indulgences, right? And with that crime, they threw out one of the most important aspects of our faith. The fact that mediation happens between us and the Lord. Even mediation happens between us. It's the Holy Spirit working in our lives. So during our formation, I said, well, That's the only thing that's different between us Protestants and and, and, uh, the father that was teaching our classes. Like, I never thought about it that way before. I said, well, is there any books on it? He goes, I think you should write one. (laughs) I'm still thinking about it. (laughs) But when two or more are present, where am I? The Lord is present. 
The best way to handle an argument is to pray. If you can pray together during that argument, you're doing pretty good. But pray. Pray that the Lord gives you the grace. How many of you know that through the sacraments you're given graces? Come on, you all were confirmed, I'm assuming. Where were, where, where, where were they? Knowledge, piety. I, I don't remember them all either. Wisdom. Awe. Awe is something that we never think about. But how awesome our God is and how awesome he wants us to be. He doesn't just want us to blindly follow him. He wants us to rejoice and follow him. So how do we do that? Prayer. Prayer is a big one. Prayer can convert people. This book can convert people, just like Father Scott said. Men's groups can convert people. How many are in a men's group? If you're not, start one or join one. If you haven't started one, call me or any of the guys in the, what was that blue color? Bay blue? (laughs) No, us men have the abilities to convince through the head other people things. That's why most salespeople are men. Well, now there's women are in it too, but we're all called to evangelize. And us Catholics haven't learned how to do that because we've only been given the responsibility to do that for 30, well, now 50 years. Because we left it up to the priests and the nuns and the religious to do all that evangelization. But it's our job to do that first where? At home. At home. And how do we do that? You become a spiritual man and you lead your family in prayer. How many of you have a sacred space in your, in your house for prayer? I'm impressed. You know, my wife and I have heard about this and we're like, prayer room? Yeah, prayer, you know, prayer room. That's a good, by the way, that's, the war room is a great movie if you want to see what the power of prayer is. That's what I got one. <laughs> anyway, it dawned on us, our living room was our prayer room because on our mantle we have all the, kind of all of our artifacts of things, you know, crosses, and I have gifts from people that have given me, and, you know, things that we've remind us to an experience in our life that called us to a deeper faith. You know, that's what the rosary does. The rosary calls us to a deeper faith. I don't have time today to talk about my conversion to the rosary because I didn't believe in intercessions. I hadn't had the wisdom of mediation thrust it upon me yet. But the power of the rosary converted me to believe in the power of intercessory prayer. And it was only through the experience of that power. I wasn't completely believing it until I saw it. But that's conversion. I used to say the rosary every time I got in the car. And some days it was kind of embarrassing because I was taking people to lunch. But I would cross myself and I'd start in with, I believe in God the Father Almighty, and they're going, what are you doing? Oh, you guys want to say a rosary with me? Huh? (laughs) Do that in a secular world. You're going to get like, are you a holy thumper or what? You know, but it's that kind of a faith that, you know, I wish I read the Bible as much as Scott has, Father Scott. You know, us Protestants are supposed to be more, what's the word? Bible followers. But if you look at the Mass, you hear the whole Bible in three years. Do you know that? You hear all the Gospels. You hear a lot of the Old Testament. The Psalms, the the responsorial between the readings. You get all the Psalms in a year. The Bible is very important. Now, one of the other gifts that we had been given that moved us a lot, because competition in our relationship, we stepped on each other's toes a lot. And I was, I was the fortunate child of parents who forgave each other in front of their children. That was a powerful witness to me. I didn't realize it, but I always had an urge, we got to settle this, we got to settle this. My wife could hold a grudge for five days. And I was the one going, I got to sell this, I got to sell this. 
But you know what that was? That was the inner calling in me to be the spiritual leader. Because brokenness is the devil's device. What's God ask of us as couples? Unity. We should to be one. Should we agree all the time? No, but we shouldn't tear each other apart either. So the forgiveness aspect of our relationship with God needs to be mirrored on earth with our spouse. We go, to, we go to the Lord and say, forgive me for this, forgive me for this, forgive me for this. We should do the same with our spouse, and we should be the first one to ask for forgiveness because it's that important to our spiritual health of our family. So on our Marriage Encounter Weekend, we were taught a means to do that. If you say you're sorry, does that help the other person? Think about that for a second. Jerry, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, it's off my... Jerry's still hurt. Didn't mean it. Didn't mean it. Yeah. Does he know I meant it? No. But if I go to Jerry and say, Jerry, forgive me for yelling at you. And I put the sign of the cross on his forehead, or her forehead. Roseanne, forgive me for procrastinating again. Procrastination is one of my worst sins. Well, I wouldn't say that. There's probably worse ones. But that act of going to her and crossing her on the forehead and asking her for forgiveness. When's the last time you asked for forgiveness from your wife? Do it. Don't think about it. Just do it. It relieves your heart, first of all. It frees your heart. It's kind of like, even if they don't forgive you at first, at least you have what? Given it over to the Lord. And really, you have. You've openly asked for forgiveness, and the Lord was there where two or more you are. Yeah. But forgiveness and healing helps you keep your marriage in harmony. It's as powerful, I think, as prayer. Because if you can't forgive each other, how long are you going to be together? And teach your children this as well. Granted, when we stepped on our kids' toes, we did that. We did it right to them. And they came to us at times when they knew they needed to ask for forgiveness. Asking for forgiveness puts you vulnerable to what? To getting the forgiveness from them. For being forgiven. Isn't that what we do in reconciliation? We, we share all of our sins. We make ourselves vulnerable for judgment. And then what's the priest do? I absolve you of your sins. Powerful. You are reconciled with the Lord. You can do that with your wife every day, sometimes ten times a day. Because what? Little mountains or little molehills grow into big mountains. But forgiveness and healing was one of the best gifts we were ever given for Roseanne and I. Because we are so different. Today, since, especially since I've become a deacon, I talk louder. Maybe my hearing's going, I don't know. But I talk with conviction, which is different than how I used to talk. I didn't recognize that right away. And Rose would get upset with me. I'm like, well, I just asked. I, I was just asking. But my tone was a demanding tone. I didn't even know I hurt her feelings. She was acting kind of mopey later, and I was like, what the hell happened to her? We don't know it when we hurt our spouse. We don't know it when we hurt our children. So sometimes it's just, forgive me for hurting you, is all you have to say. Forgive me for hurting you. It builds bridges. It opens up their hearts. It opens up your heart because you're being what? True to her. True to your vow of loving and honoring her all of the days of her life. Forgiveness and healing. I can tell you I've experienced it in so many dimensions. It works. Real quick. I cried on my 44th birthday in front of my hometown post office after my dad told me this. Son, you don't have to apologize. 
I am very proud of you. You know what guilt was on my mind? For almost 18 years, becoming Catholic. Forgiveness rebuilds the creation God created. Use it. You mentioned St. Joseph Paul. He is probably the best example of being a spiritual leader in the family. He was true to his Jewish customs. In fact, it was just, we just had the reading not too long ago about why he didn't leave Mary when he found out she was pregnant. This was before he even was approached by the Lord. He was going to quietly divorce her. When if he would have made a stink, what would have happened to her? She would have been killed. killed because she was caught in an adultery. They were already married. If you go back into Jewish customs, they had some really interesting things. But he stuck by her side. He protected them. They fled to Egypt. Can you imagine what it had been like? I mean, what did he do for work? How did they, how'd they get along? Yeah, they got the gold, frankincense, and myrrh, but that only held out for so, how long? And then all of a sudden he disappears. We don't hear of him after they find Jesus in the temple. But isn't it interesting that he and Mary looked for three days for the Lord when he was in the temple? That was Joseph's crucifixion day. He couldn't find his son. You know, the son of God. What the heck happened to me? What was I thinking? I should have been protecting him. You know, you, you can just think of what all the things that Joseph was going through. That was his three days in the tomb. I read a book called 12 Ordinary Men. It's by, a, I think, a Methodist or a Presbyterian minister who studied um, the, the Jewish people around the time of the Roman Empire rule. And he really believes that Joseph may have been enlisted or drafted into the Roman army because of the wars that were going on at the time. And, you know, just boom, he's gone. But he gave his, death, he gave his life for his family. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to lay down your life for your wife or your kids or the whole, the whole bunch? You need to. You need to have that kind of conviction. <clears throat> We as the head of our households are to guard our children. But we are also challenged, if you read in the Gospels, to raise our children into the faith of God. Teach them the Ten Commandments. Teach brings up another song. Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. Teach your children well. You remember that song? I almost sing that one. It's a great song because it really teaches us how to teach our children. We teach. How do we teach? How did St. Francis say we should teach? Well, he said, preach the Gospels, and if necessary, use words. <laughs> What's he saying? Live. By how you live, you teach. So in pre-Cana, we tell couples in pre-Cana and baptism classes, we said, Okay, don't lay a lot of rules on your kids. We'll just give you that advice. Because rules were meant to be broken. This was a wisdom handed to us. Teach them your values. And grow your values. Because you have to live your values in order for them to stick to your children. And a humbling experience for me was seeing my children's values being greater than my own. Brings tears to my eyes when I think about it. But what a gift. What a gift. If you want your kids to be Catholic the rest of your life, teach them your values. Don't just teach them Catholic teachings. Teach them the values that you live and be a spiritual man. Because it takes a spiritual man, I think, to teach those values of right from wrong. Why the world out there says one thing and we say another inside our house. It's a value. I value that because... That's the way we were told to live by God and the Ten Commandments. It's what we've found to cherish because it keeps us 
out of the mess of the world. God asks us to raise our children to follow him. I already covered that. Lastly, I'm going to go about five minutes longer. Forgiveness and healing. How many of you recognize this portrait? It's the Rembrandt's, one of Rembrandt's last paintings. Yeah, people in Luna Mellows know this because I've given a homily on it. The prodigal father accepts back the son. We all know the prodigal story. I mean, it's a parable in the, in the gospel. But we heard a unique version of this at a men's retreat that we had in our parish. And it spoke of the Jewish culture, how the Jewish culture actually uses this parable. I thought the Jews didn't follow Jesus. Well, they, they used some of his, his works. Because back in those days, people didn't live on farms. Where'd they live? They lived in a city with walls, with gates, to protect themselves from whoever. Remember the story, the father runs out? He's, he's looking for his son. You know, the word, I think, is he, he keeps his eye out for his son. And when he sees him approaching the city, what does he do? He runs out to meet him, is what it says in the gospel. But in reality, that would have meant that he ran out of the city and met him on the road. Why? What did the son do? Took his inheritance. Took his inheritance. Before when? Before his father died. Yeah. The father was the patriarch of the family. What's the worst thing you could do to the patriarch of the family? Consider him dead. Yeah. And the son did it. But what did the father do? The father ran out of the city to save his son because the Jewish culture called for what? To someone that disrespects the patriarchs. Stone them. To stone them. That's not in the Gospels. And it's a beautiful story because it just totally enlivens what this man, the spiritual leader of the family, did. He not only forgave his son, he saved his son's life. Puts a bigger, bigger portion on it, doesn't it? What's our Heavenly Father want to do? Save us. Save us. He wants to forgive us. You had that opportunity today. Take it. Because this story has so much wealth of knowledge that the Lord teaches us. In this story, he's telling us, forgive one another. And often. Even when you just bump into each other. You know, you may not have to cross each other. Oh, forgive me. I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> What's it going to hurt? Does it make you a bigger man not to forgive your wife? No, I think it makes you less than a man. But that's what our world needs to see. That's what our church is calling us to be. To be spiritual men. I've got one more handout for you. I didn't touch a lot on parenting because this was more of being a spiritual leader of the family. But how many of you know that our diocese has a media center that you can actually get material for to watch or read or study? You know, I didn't know this either, but parish offices know it, but it's not shared. So I'm sharing with you some things that are available for parenting from little kids, and there's, there's one person on there that I know most of you people know, that's Matthew Kelly. How many people have read a book from Matthew Kelly? You know, the Rediscovering Jesus, that, or Rediscovering Jesus is the one that we're reading right now at uh, St. Ludomelis for Lent, uh, but Father mentioned uh, Rediscovering Catholicism, that was one of Matthew's earlier books. Reading is good if you read the right books. How's that? Yeah. <laughs> if you're reading the smut on the internet, that ain't the way you're supposed to be going. 
Read the Bible, but then read some books that might motivate you. On that goldenrod colored sheet, uh, I put some lists of, if you have a specific cross you're carrying, what saint should you go read about? I always thought St. Augustine was my, my, my patron saint because of how sinful I was before I got married. But I look down that list, I'm going, holy cow, I should read about all these guys. But we're all sinners. And only through confession can we receive absolution. But as spiritual leaders, encourage your fellow brothers, because I don't think you guys are church skippers. You wouldn't be here. But seek out those men in your parish that aren't coming to church. Bring them to one of these events. This would have been a great event for some men that aren't here, right? Yeah. All men that aren't here have been a great event. If you have a men's group, invite them. The way I got to a men's group was after a CEW, but that doesn't have to be the path. And with that, I'll, I'll let you go.